What we're dealing with here, I think this, the topic I'm going to, I'm going to be raising this afternoon is, I, to my mind, one of the most fascinating for the whole course, I think most fascinating for a whole life. And that is trying to fathom the nature of our own minds, the very nature of subjectivity itself, the very nature of consciousness. And can that be done in ways that are rigorous? Can it be done in ways that can lead to consensus? We know that if you're measuring, let's say, gra gravity, the force of gravity, and whether it's an inverse square law and an inverse cube, cr cube law, there's consensus. You do the experiments, and we can all agree. And that's with a very basic thing, but there's a lot of consensus in science, regardless of how much you know, discrepancies there are, debates there are about in, in fields of cutting-edge science. Nevertheless, this is one of the great strengths of science, that unlike philosophy and unlike the world's religions altogether, there is a high degree of consensus within the scientific community that you don't find among different philosophical schools, and you don't find if you had a Muslim and a Buddhist and a Jain and so forth in the same room, a lot more consensus in science. So the question here is this. Might there be ways of investigating the nature of subjective experience, the mind, and consciousness itself in ways that could give rise to consensus that would be so rigorous and so repeatable in terms of repeatable observations and repeatable experiments that you can conduct, not on the, on the brain explicitly, but explicitly on your mind and implicitly on your brain. Whereas a lot of research is done explicitly on the brain and implicitly on the mind, right? And so this raises the possibility of observation. First of all, if you want to know about something, whether it's the moons of Jupiter or sunspots or whether it's your own mind, the first thing is to see, well, can it be observed at all? Right? Sean, can the mind be observed? Yes. All right. Can the, the mind can be observed. It's not only remembered, but it's observed, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, there would be people that would disagree with you, but I certainly agree with you. And then the question is, are there problems in that? Now, a major theme of taboo of subjectivity is that the observation of the mind, and not only observation, but then the probing, investigation, the analysis, the real you know, checking into the nature of the mind, uh, that would entail a violation, not of scientific procedure, that is, it's not, impl not intrinsically anti-scientific. That's, that's my argument. That it's not just an unscientific thing to do. But rather, it, so it, I would argue that the immediate, first-hand, first-person, direct observation and exploration of the mind does not violate any scientific principle. There's nothing in intrinsically unscientific about it, but it does violate a principle, an axiom of scientific materialism. Which one, Kyle? Think back. It's good to memorize those. It's not that big a list, because it's really core to understanding the whole of taboo. What's the very first one? Object objectivism. Yeah. What's the core of objectivism? Yeah. Something that's independent of any specific subject, any specific individual. It's out there lending itself to third-person kind of cross-vectoring of a bunch of people looking at the same thing. Right? And it's independent of any individual subject. So that's one aspect. That's kind of the ontological aspect in terms of being, in terms of reality. That this is what scientists study. They study things that are themselves objective, and they do so objectively. Right? They do so without, as, or with as little as possible, of subjective bias. One's own personal preferences, one's own likes and dislikes. Try to just be clear, open-minded, unbiased, unprejudiced, so you're doing it objectively, and then you study something that is itself objective. All right. So in the first sense, of, so one, one can say the second one is epistemological, or psychological even, has to do with your subject and what type of subject you're bringing to the object in question. And the other one is ontological, and that is what are you going to study? What type of a phenomenon will you study? And science, habitually, going back to Copernicus, Copernicus looking at things very far away, like the sun, the moon, and so forth, is looking at things that exist independently of any specific subject. That is, whether I look at the moon or not is really pretty irrelevant. Truths about the nature of the moon, whether it has craters or doesn't have craters, does not depend upon me. Or the fact that Galileo was Italian as opposed to Manchurian, a man as opposed to a woman, and so on. Okay? It's not contingent upon any particular individual. Now, what about the nature of the mind? Aaron. What about the nature of the mind? Is the mind, is, is the mind something that's objective? No. no, it's not, is it? Your mind, I mean, we have to deal with somebody's mind. If we could say, well, never mind your mind, your mind, your mind, just, well, we'll just study mind. You know? 
Well, whose? God's? Um, actually, that was kind of, I mean, to, to slip into a very interesting tangent, that was. Exactly, this sounds like a joke. But in fact, that was in the minds of some of the early scientists, people like Galileo and others, that by studying creation, by studying things like balls rolling down ramps, by, tr by understanding and observing and, tr and trying to fathom the nature of creation, they would directly, they would indirectly be able to fathom the mind of the creator. Why? And we ran through that earlier. How could you imagine, how could you possibly have the chutzpah or the confidence to think that you, like a person like yourself, like myself, that you, with you, with your mind, could fathom the mind of God? Why? Because you created in the image of God. So, in principle, why not? If God were a dog and we're created in the form of cats, then you might have a hard time. But, God said, you know, created man in the image of God. Man and women, it's both. All right, so there was a notion there that to study creation, to fathom creation, you could indirectly fathom the mind of God. Okay? And how so? With what, with what basis? Because your own mind, your own being, your own existence is created in the image of God. So bear in mind, from early on, from very early on, this scientific enterprise was deeply rooted in theology. Okay? I mean, that's just a fact. I think that's not debatable. But now here, now in the 21st century, one may or may not bring that premise to the table as you're engaging in scientific research. And so, and you may, but you don't need to, obviously. There are a lot of people who are not Christian who are doing very good science. So if we're going to study mind, then you're going to have to make it more specific. Whose mind? And if you're going to study mind firsthand by direct observation and not by inference, for example, my studying your mind by way of observing your behavior, okay, that's a possibility, then I'm the behaviorist. Okay? Or I'll try to understand your desires, your beliefs, your predilections, your preferences by the way you behave. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. But I'm observing your, or I'm in, inferring rather, inferring your mind states, your desires and so forth, based upon something that is not a mind state, namely the outer display, right? In other words, your behavior. So that's one possibility. Or a friend of mine up at UC, UC San Francisco studies emotions. And one very pr primary way that he studies emotions is by very, very detailed analysis of facial expressions. Okay? And the facial expressions are, again, they're like smoke from the fire of the emotions. Okay? They're being produced by the emotions. And then you infer backwards. So all of this outwardly, as I observe facial expressions, bodily behavior, modes of speaking, and so on. Or maybe I'm a doctor, and I check your Tibetan doctor, and I check your pulse, and start making inferences about your mental state, how anxious you are, levels of anxiety, agitation, and so forth, based upon your pulse. That's a possibility. But of course, it's once again inference. Because you're in a certain mind state, it influences your metabolism in such and such a way, so I'm inferring back. But in terms of direct observation, not inference now, what minds can we observe directly? I think that's it, a pretty short list. At least for starters. I mean, that's something I think we can be fairly confident of. We are not oblivious of the states of our own mind. Right now, are you grief-stricken, are you elated, or something in between? Are you agitated, or are you calm, something in between? And so on, and so on, and so on. You can know. I can infer, I can presume, I can speculate. Bearing in mind that sometimes people veil their, veil their emotions very well. They seem very calm, and they're extremely angry, or, you know, and so on, and so on. But if you attend closely, if you pay attention, if you observe your own mental states, then there is an access to observing a mind that could be without bias. So in other words, I would propose to you that it is possible, maybe difficult, but it's possible to objectively observe your own mind. Objectively in the softer sense of doing it without bias. Observing the mind and not saying, well, whatever I see, it's going to be good. Right? Or I know I'm a nice guy, so whatever comes up on my mind has to be really nice, because after all, I'm a nice guy. That would be subjective bias and prejudice, where I would filter out anything that did not correspond to my notion of being a nice guy. Right? So I would suggest that may be difficult. We may have a hard time or find, have a resistance to observing and acknowledging tendencies in our own minds that we find unsavory, or that we find do not correspond to what we think of ourselves, how we think of ourselves how we've construed our own self-identity. But not impossible. We know some people are really, really out to lunch, right? really wildly wrong in terms of their own self-assessment or their own attentiveness to their own mental states. They don't even know when they're agitated, for example.
or one of the favorite stories for my family, I think it was my older sister. And when you, you know, little kids, I mean, like four years old, five years old. And my little, my, actually, it's my older sister, so I know this by hearsay. But, you know, she was having a bad day. And she was, she was kind of grumpy and crying. And my dad said, why don't you be happy? You know, why, you know, parents get really frustrated when they're doing everything they can for the kids and they're still unhappy. So my dad said, why don't you be happy, Kathy? And she said, I am happy, Daddy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I suspect she actually was in touch with her emotions, but you know, she, gave, she gave what she thought was the appropriate answer. In any case, we can misconstrue. We can misconstrue by conceptually superimposing upon experience what we think should be there, which we want to be there, we remembered as being there, but isn't there any longer. In any case, I would suggest to you that it's possible to objectively observe states which, I, who was it, somebody right here, Aaron, said, is not objective. Your own mind is not independent, does not exist, function, independently of any specific subject. Otherwise, you count you out and your mind would linger. So no, our own minds clearly are related to ourselves. So this would mean you have to violate an axiom of scientific materialism to scientifically study the mind in terms of direct observation of mental states, in other words, fully acknowledging the reality of subjective mental states, as opposed to just studying the brain, which is a possibility, by means of which you can infer mental processes or behavior, facial expressions, and so on.